just before Perfect Lives, there were, well, in the 70s, there were also a fantastic series which we have on, um, uh, I think we have him on DVD um, in the library of called Music uh, with the Roots in the Ether. Roots in the Ether. There's a story yeah. about that. I'm sure there is. Bob was applying to either the Ford or the Rachel Foundation, Foundations, our old friend Howard Klein, who was one of the great supporters of new music in America for many years, was working he, at different times. He worked for each of them, so I don't know which one it was. And he came in with a project to make a series of portraits of his contemporaries. I think Phil Glass is there, Pauline Oliveros, David Behrman, Terry Riley. Terry Riley. Ter in Terry's one, Terry, they're out on Terry's, uh, it's, 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 it's a, again a video uh, piece. They're, they're, Terry is milking a goat while they're talking. Because <laughs> he lived in Nevada City, he still yeah. does, he lives in the countryside. Um, but uh, Bob said, this is kind of a documentary. And the guy said, well, you know, they're not really funding documentaries this year. They're more interested in opera. And Bob said, well, then it's an opera. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they're called. They're called yeah, operas. Yeah, that was the first one. But no, Perfect Lives is more like an opera that than is it is more a performance. Like yeah. But people would challenge him. Uh, he's got a piece that's got visual and uh, uh, musical elements and that tells a story. Uh, but it does it so unconventionally that they say, well, that's not an opera. He says, it's an opera if I say it's an opera. Because <laughs> it is an opera. It, and we, well, it'd be, perhaps it'd be good to talk a bit about that, about the term opera in relation to his work a bit later on. Okay. I wonder, before we do that, maybe Thomas then, we've, we've seen a bit of what um, kind of Bob Ashley's early work there. Tell me how you first encountered Bob Ashley personally and how you got to perform with him. Okay. Uh, actually, when Bob Ashley moved to Mills College to found the Center for Contemporary Music there in Oakland, California, uh, he had had a big career as a different kind of experimental composer. He founded in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he was born, n near the, you know, where the University of Michigan is. Uh, a group called the Once Group, and that's, you can look that up, it's rather famous for, uh, almost everybody came there every year they would do a big event that involved mainly improvisation, but that could only be done once. When you did it, it was done. There was, the materials that were used on it were gone. And uh, Robert Rauschenberg would come out there, uh, John Cage would come by, uh, Anybody, if they got interested, everybody would just come and they didn't hire people to come out there. They came out there to just do the project. It was sort of like the force of Bob's personality. And he had architects working on it, building huge structures that would then be used up in the performing of it. Um, so, and he had, with the Sonic Arts Union, with uh, David Behrman, Gordon Muma, and uh, uh, Alvin Lucier. Alvin, yeah. my dear friend, Alvin Lucier. Uh, they toured as a group of composers who assisted each other in the performances of each other's works. Uh, and uh, it was astounding what those guys did in the, in the, the 60s. Yeah. Uh, and so Bob was already, that's why he was hired at Mills. He was known for using the studio as a compositional tool, having a big imagination and bringing in all kinds of elements into his work. But he'd not done operas yet. So he looks, there he is, a middle-aged man, starting as an opera composer, because uh, he'd been another kind of composer first. Uh, <coughs> he was at Mills, and I was in Berkeley, and I was running a concert space that, that uh, we, I didn't know any better, so we presented 100 concerts a year. Every weekend we'd have uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and Sundays, or maybe two or three on some weekends, from September till June, when my kids were in school and I was in town, I wanted to have an active life in music without having to tour a lot. So I figured out how to stay busy and stay home. And uh, that was part of it. And I was so busy doing what I was doing and running an ensemble of 23 pieces that was performing. It was the, ens it was the only ensemble on the West Coast that was that large to play the music of California composers and did three sets a year. Uh, and short story is I never got out to Mills very much to hear what Bob was doing, but I was hearing about it. And I admired him very much because that public access, that studio, 
was the first and maybe only public access electronic music studio and computer music studio at the end of every day it was open to the public to come in anybody who was interested could come in and sign up and take a lesson and learn how to use it and then could come in and make their music on it mm. there was a local priest who wanted to have electronic music in his uh, services he came <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievable what they were doing I went checked it out and learned a little bit about how to use a bukla. But bukla, you know, lived around the corner from me, so uh, <laughs> I had other access to the buklas. And, 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 but it was a fantastic thing. And they, he had a couple of wonderful rules. Student concerts, no critics allowed. Because he said that the worst thing for a young composer is to be hearing strong opinions evaluating their work whether they be positive or negative that you need to be able to develop your ideas without authority you know evaluating you all the time in the form of critics uh, so I thought that was a, a good principle um, now we of course we're all hoping we can get a critic to come and recognize that we <laughs> exist but, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, After 10 years of running our group, we had the opportunity to commission somebody. The NEA gave us a consortium grant, and each of the four groups in the consortium chose a composer. We chose Bob because, in our opinion, he had the most original mind in contemporary music. We were so excited about the opportunity to be able to pay him to make a piece for a larger ensemble. I like the idea of giving people access to resources that they don't normally have access to. And so here's this guy who's totally electronic and, uh, and have him... So he was going to, he'd heard it here, he'd heard me enough, and I'd met him, we knew each other, not particularly well, that instead of writing us an occasional piece, he took an aria out of his then opera, Atalanta, that he was working on, and uh, made an arrangement of it for baritone and chamber orchestra. And he was, at that time, he was moving to New York, and uh, little did he know that I was going to be moving to New York too, so he wrote it with the idea that it had to be lear learnable by somebody without him there to help them. Because his way of making music is so special. His idea is that the music is in the words and that he writes the words to bring the music out. He, 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 the rhythms that he's writing are pre preconceived or m rhythms that he hears in the, in the words and he brings them out and makes, he makes all kinds, uses all kinds of internal rhyme, all kinds of rhythmic structures that happen and reappear during the lines. If you study it and analyze a piece to prepare to perform it, you, you don't run out of things to find that were clearly worked out in the text by the composer. He's not just a guy with some nice ideas who writes them down. I mean, it's really worked over structurally very, very carefully. And uh, the idea is that, the, so what he had to do is he had to notate in music notation the rhythm of the piece, of, of the exact spoken rhythm. It would be like, we find this case in connection with a single woman of high family and low taste. That shows something. Her grandmother disapproved. They always do. But that didn't stop her. Father's side of the family was said to be to blame. They were in architecture, which is evidently respectable, but artistic nevertheless. And uh, it, when that is done in, uh, what happened is we did it that way with the orchestra, and it was moderately successful but in preparing it I, I those, those those rhythms were written as notes and I was learning it and I moved to New York during that time and I had a, 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 a friend from New York who'd come back there from New York too and we were rooming together a great hand drummer uh, who went by it goes by the name Big Black not the Big Black that was in pop music for a while but this guy was a hand drummer he played with Dizzy Gillespie's orchestra regularly uh, in bands and uh, with Randy Weston, the great pianist. And uh, he learned everything entirely by ear. Couldn't read a note of music, but once he heard it, he had it. He started playing along with the rhythms I was working on on the, on the Ashley, so that I was doing it locked into a drummer. So when I went to Bob's house to show him what I was working on, he just was sort of bowled over because nobody had ever spent that kind of time and attention on his music. 
uh, the, the uh, perfect life. He had a couple of wonderfully talented graduate students uh, playing the part, and look, they looked great. They were perfect for the part, but they weren't working on, they were just doing simple little chorus things. So he came out to the West Coast to hear the premiere. And when it was over, he said, I'm doing the premiere of a new opera called Atalanta, Acts of God in Rome in you know, a month and a half. Uh, I'd like you to join the company. And I had just moved to New York and I, and I didn't know his work very well. I said, gee, that sounds really interesting. I love working on this piece, but is there a way I can learn a little bit about the piece? I said, oh yeah, we're doing it up at Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, in, in Boston, uh, Cambridge. Why don't you come up? And so I came up to hear them perform it. And that's a story that takes too long to tell, except that but what, what ended up happening was that I loved it. And I said I'd like to do it. And since I can sing in Italian, because people who study voice, that's what you learn to do, uh, uh, he said, well, translate the arias that you're doing into Italian. So the same principle, which he notated, it was more simple. We find this case in connection with a sing single woman of high family. If you spoke it in Italian, abbiamo trovato questo caso, connesso con una donna sola di famiglia elevata e di gusti bassi. Abbiamo trovato questo caso, connesso con una donna sola di famiglia elevata e di gusti bassi. Quella dimostra qualcosa, la sua nonna disapprovava. Totally spontaneous musical intention based on the declamation of the text. The text has the melody in it. Abbiamo trovato questo caso. Abbiamo trovato questo caso. And then, and then he and I we went to the opera a lot during that time. So all the da da, all the, the various tricks that they use. And, and so it's like a big recitative. Uh, and everything in it was done f f from f f f what, he, what he wants his singers to do is spontaneous musical invention based on the declamation of the text. Then he gives you the harmonies to work with, and Atalanta had one set of harmonies. So he was working with that set of harmonies that he made for that piece. And I remember my girlfriend at the time said, would you write me a flute piece? He said, well, I'd love to, but I have to use the chords that I'm using in Atalanta because I've focused, my whole focus is on those chords, that thing. So if I write it, I'm not going to get out of that mood. I have to write it with those chords. So he did. And uh, there's a wonderful book published by Music Text in German and English. Uh, and one of the chapters is, where do the ideas come from? And he talks about the necessity of eliminating all reference to anything you've written before, before you start a new piece. And, uh, uh, and he would, he would uh, uh, just get totally ensconced. And his reading matter would be too uh, limited. Uh, in this case, they all come out of his daily life Atalanta is a pre-Homeric Greek myth that you may or may not know about a, a woman who was born into a royal family, uh, you know, before Homer, way back. Uh, uh, to a, her father, the king, was so disappointed that he didn't have a son that he left her outside the castle walls, presumably to die. But she was rescued by animals and grew up to become, among other things, the fastest running living human being. So this is how he composed the, the piece, based it on this myth. What happened was that the father, the king, figured out that she was uh, his, his daughter and invited her back to live in the palace. And he wanted to marry her off for political reasons. But uh, she said, I won't marry anybody who can't beat me in a foot race. And if he loses, off with his head. A lot of men tried and a lot of men died. And this fellow Hippomenes prayed to the goddess of love, Aphrodite. And she gave him uh, three golden apples. You may have seen pictures in museums of Greek clad people running and re one woman is reaching down and picking up an apple. Uh, the idea was she passes you, which she will because she's fastest, throw the apple in front of her, she stops to pick it up, you pass her. Then the next time throw it again, she stops and picks it up. And that happened and the last time she didn't catch him and he won the race. So uh, th then the, 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 the Greeks always asked the question, did he outsmart her or was she impressed with him and she chose him and she let him win? So Bob took the position that she let him win and asked the question in the opera, what kind of woman, what kind of man I mean, would the exceptional woman choose? And he says it's an artist. And then he says, well, there's three aspects of the arts. There's uh, 
art, visual art. There's storytelling and poetry. And there's uh, music. And each of the apples represents one of these. And they're represented by a character whom Bob actually had known. The opera has three acts. Max, for Max Ernst. Willard, for Bob's uncle Willard, who was the great storyteller in his family, who were hillbillies. They came from uh, Tennessee. And, but when Bob was born, they'd moved to Michigan. So he, he's only a hillbilly by heritage. And then uh, uh, the last act is called Bud, for Bob's favorite, uh, Bud Powell, the great jazz pianist. And uh, tonight, if you can come to the concert, one of the pieces is called The Producer Speaks. And it's a story about a producer in France who came to America and, uh, as a young man and learned about American music at that time, which was bebop, and right after the, after the war. And uh, he has this train ride with these two black musicians uh, who both play the piano. Bud is the name of the album, and the other person is Thelonious Monk. And uh, just, it's a slow train trip down to the south of France for a concert it's going to be that night, and they don't say a word. And it's him thinking about what has he done? And how's he going to decide which piano player will play first? He's the piano player. <laughs> uh, so, it's, it's a, it, uh, so that's one. Uh, the, the, he wrote an aria to the odalisk for each of these characters. The odalisk being Atalanta, being the inaccessible woman. And the, you know, the odalisk is the woman who lives in the back of the harem where even the sultan can't come unless she invites him. So it's a turning the whole thing on, on, on its end. And the, uh, the, the odalisks were actually, who lived in the odo were really, they, they lasted through different sultans. They had a lot of political power. So the, the situation of women was in fact quite, if they were exceptional, it was quite different than the situation that we think of. And, uh, and then there was an anecdote about them, which is what this, uh, the one that we're, that we're going to do is. A character, a character reference, a character reference for Max Ernst. When I met him, he was pretty old, but he still had the resistance. I said, do you mind if I smoke? He said, you can smoke marijuana if you want to. And then it goes on to talking about uh, Max Ernst's collage novels where the where the edges are so smooth you can't tell they're there. And he said, you don't do that kind of work in a good mood. And the analogy <laughs> for that is with ball bearings. He has a ball bearing factory. We make the best ball bearings in the world. Uh, but it's, it's, it's this whole big classical reference on which you hang all these contemporary stories. You know, you know, uh, uh, I'm not doing the one about, yes, I am. Uh, there's an, another one that comes from Atalanta. Atalanta was actually his favorite opera that he made, he said, uh, and because and, it's so all-encompassing. He wrote 10 hours of material, and from that 10 hours you could pick whatever you wanted for each act, or you could just do one act if that's what you wanted to do. But, but the format we did it in was the uh, Odalisk Aria, the ca character reference, uh, the uh, uh, family stories, and the uh, 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 anecdotes. Can I, so when you say you've got, th there are 10 hours of, mu of, yes. of, of work, yeah. is that uh, 10 hours of, of essentially text? It's text and pitch choices, because I didn't get to that yet. You not only use the melody implicit in the words, in the rhythms, but he's very careful about placing the tessitura so that it's getting the emotional quality he wants uh, out of the, 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 the out of this so, so he that puts that in the vocal part those or choices is that, that you respond to in the no you it's it, you, you know you, he gives you a pitch to use okay it, that's in the score okay uh, I could pass a little something around okay so what happened was we're working on Atlanta and I'm doing and we were in Rome and I had a nice Italian lady teaching me how to speak Italian better and uh, they were doing a lot of work on the technique of the piece and uh, hardly any work for us to really rehearse. But you were supposed to you know, work on it on your own. And, and, uh, and so the very first performance that we actually got through the whole piece 
was the premier. <laughs> we did it, I think, four or five times there. Mm -hmm. And that's the one he liked best for the recording. So that's the recording of Atlanta, is that. Um, it's, uh, so we're, we're in Rome working on that. And then I asked Bob if he might make a piece no, he had the idea of making a piece for the two of us so we could do some work. So he played piano and, and uh, uh, I, I sang a piece and it's so wonderful when a composer, this is what got me so excited about doing only new music. The composer says to you, well, how long a breath can you sing comfortably? I worked on it and I said, well, 21 seconds. So, mm -hmm. I felt I had forgotten. My brother called. It's the beginning of the piece we're going to do second in the concert. Uh, and it's filled with his, all the melisma parts are clearly written out. And the other parts, when you get to the words, you do his system of, of doing it. But it puts you on one of two chanting pitches for the whole text. Mm -hmm. And the, the range of the melismas, that is all, all affects that the voice is providing the appropriate emotional tone quality, which is different in the ranges of each of the singers you'll use. He believes in the least amount of notation, just enough that you are given what you need to be able to do with it what you want to do. It's, a, a, it's as little about f following directions as you can be in making a piece of music. Um, so he's got the, the outline of the melody, and then he has uh, on the music where the main beats come, and then he has the line text written out with the underline for the main beats. Usually that's what he'll do in any text. He'll just write a, a line under, or as in the one we're doing, he puts a double line where each of the beats are in, in, in your part. Uh, but uh, there's all kinds of ways you could do it. Oh, and then there's one thing. He has this notes. As you notice, there's a little scale going up after the words. Those are the only notes you can use in that line. So it starts with just going up a half step, and then the next one goes up a minor, a minor third, and then the next one would do. Now, you don't have to use the whole scale, but you can't use the higher notes until they're in the group of notes that are allowed to be used in the end. And, and he likes you to keep it in a relatively small range so that it sounds like speaking, even though uh, you know, in the operas, which you'll hear if we have, I hope we get to it, uh, each of the four singers that he chose to be the main singers in all his operas has a totally different style and background as a singer. I had some classical singing. I mean, I, I didn't want to be a classical opera singer, but I wanted to sing our songs and stuff. Uh, uh, I, Joan LaBarbera was also classically trained, but she went into her sound world. Uh, Jackie Humbert, who was in the cast, is really a pop singer, and Bob's son Sam is totally unique. <laughs> He's got his own way of doing things. Um, and, and then uh, Bob Ashley himself, as a yeah. as a singer, was also seemed to have developed his own very yes, unique he did. style. Yes, he figured out. Uh, but that the idea, this idea of making the melody out of the words, that was his big insight. And uh, he, you know, he he actually studied the science of voice in the university. He went to graduate school, and he he. Uh, uh, so not only linguistics, but also the, the physics of, of how the voice works and stuff. He was very interested in that. He also wanted to be, at one point, a classical concert pianist. And he went to Manhattan School of Music and uh, was preparing for that. Uh, but luckily, he got drafted, went to uh, Puerto Rico. And, uh, uh, and when he came back, he didn't go back to being a classical pianist. He went on to you know, be a composer. But, uh, uh, so the comma represents a place where you can take a breath if you're running out. Uh, but since we, he wrote it for me, I don't have to take a breath on any of the lines uh, unless it makes the words clearer. Uh, and in this particular one, the chanting pitches are the F natural and the uh, A flat. Uh, but again, you can make them, you can make, and you can use the notes 
that go up, you can use them down too. So you can wait there for a phone call. You can you you, you don't have to just do it uh, uh, everyone up. You can, and and uh, but you're supposed to. The idea is learn the rhythms thoroughly, learn how to speak it in the rhythm, and gradually let the melodies that are in the speaking transform into some level aspect of singing. It's like I call it singing in a manner of speaking. And uh, each of us would then do it a different way. Some of them, really, they're basically talking on pitch. Uh, because if you don't read music and you don't have any music training, and he wants that, you're going to be talking on pitch, just sort of half chanting and half speaking. And uh, it, it, makes, it, it, it makes a really nice thing when you'll hear it on the ensembles, when each person is doing a different version of that approach, you get wonderful uh, rhythms and, and uh, effects. So that's... C can I ask then, um, because you talk about the individual voices of the different yeah. performers, not only in Atlanta, but in, in subsequent operas too, yeah. there's very clear uh, when you listen to the recordings, you really hear the individual voices. Yeah. But at the same time, there seems to be something of a Robert Ashley style. Oh, as absolutely. Well. It's and all, I wonder it what, what, it what is. is that and for you? First of all, it's vernacular. You, you, it's, uh, it's not declamatory. It's not playing the part of a character so much usually as telling a story. And uh, well, you heard him. He was doing it there in that thing. Very well, that is a, st a style. Yeah. Uh, and that's what he does, and he wanted to get that style in different kinds of, of voices. So are you trying to, um, through your own particular performance style, but also respond to Ashley's own voice, his own Well, manner? what we did is, we, I, I was very lucky. When I moved to New York, I worked, uh, moved by chance to be about a block away from him. So I was on one side of Canal Street, and he was on the other, and I would brave crossing this street, which is all the cars coming in from the Holland Tunnel, to be able to get over to where he was. And uh, we worked, you know, several times a week for months just just developing the style uh -huh. uh, and contributing, you know, what each of us could do to it. Uh, uh, so that was a very big privilege for me to get to do that. But I'm not, he doesn't want you to, constant, to conscientiously imitate me. First of all, you can't. Yeah. Because he's got... His, his, his accent is so beautiful and his old, you know, you, you can't, it's, not, it's not worth trying to do because you won't succeed. Um, but once you're open to the idea that you're telling a story and that you're using your, that, that, that it's not like a war between the music and the words, which is what most songs in the classical tradition really are. The best teacher of that that I ever had uh, said that you learn the words completely first perform it as a speech so that the, the way the words were meant to be spoken by the poet are in you. Then you learn the melody completely separately from the words so that when you're singing the melody, it doesn't change the natural accents in the way you should speak the words to make them understood. Then you can sing an art song and actually be, people can be moved by both the music and the words. A very rare thing to happen. You always get that stilted sound. Mm -hmm. So Bob was really trying to get away from that silted sound and, and, and yet have more music in it than would be if you were just speaking. Uh, and I think he came up with a system that has been effective. I think for those of us who know the operas and have listened to them repeatedly, they're so informed by your voice, because you're there really from Atlanta onwards. Yes. You're in, in, in so many of the performances. And yeah. Joan LaBarbera. She also. joined, you know, first it was me and Jackie Humbert and then Bob's son Sam. Yeah. Actually Bob's son Sam was first, but then he went off to study shamanism right. in uh, South America. And so the premiere, he was not there to do, but he joined the company after that. Yeah, uh, uh, he did. <laughs> I, and <laughs> well, he, Bob, uh, Sam, literally, if you asked him what he was, he was a, a mystic. He was a, his, his job. You know, every year he would go out in the desert and, and, and see visions and stuff. That was his, that was his life. Yeah. So it's, it's not a made-up idea for peace or something. Yeah. Uh, so that's what he wanted to do with his life. Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, so th but these key voices are really so 
you, you can't separate them from yeah. my hearing of the operas. Yeah. You know, your voice, Jonah Barber's. Jacqueline but you're going to get a chance because I hope they record. There's a new young company of people right. in their 20s. Bob Femi is very smart. He died, and she said, we're going to start a new band of people, of young people, because huh. there was a group of young people called Veris Speed who were making performances of Bob's uh, perfect lives in the world. They were going out to a bar and performing the bar in the bar, and then going to a park and performing outdoors in the park, just letting people know they were coming. Supermarket, get permission from the supermarket guy to set up in the supermarket and play it. And Bob heard them, went and heard them do it and decided he wrote a piece for them before he died. And then Mimi is now putting all the operas into current technology right. and hiring groups of young people to perform them. And I hope they record uh, yeah. because uh, yeah. then you'll hear it works quite well with other voices. Well, that's fascinating. And uh, I also, I mean, it's fascinating also to hear that you did it I mean, very early on in Italian. As yeah, well, that's yeah, also com yeah, yeah. completely fascinating because well, it it feels it like such an American yeah, it is. voice. But that uh, that in that piece, we were invited to perform in Italy by a director and his wife, who was a fine, sort of avant-garde actress, and she used her voice in amazing ways. She was totally out there, and so there was already Italian in that performance. He'd had some other parts right. translated for her to perform, yeah. uh, and, and uh, uh, but we that's the only one we've done. It was mainly to increase. Uh, but the thing was. When we translated it back into English and did it at the premiere at the Goodman Theater in Chicago, it didn't work. Yeah. And the, translating the, it back from the Italian. Yeah, yeah, in other words, doing it in the English, original, yeah. the original English, the character had already established right. himself yeah. in Italian, and it was very lyrical, and it was a very big part of the piece. Okay. Doing it in English, it would be, we found this case in connection with a single woman of high family. That would be very different than the other one, Abbiamo Trovato. So, so there you are. It, 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 it's had to stay that way. Do you think they could be? They could work in other languages. I of mean, course. even the Italian one, for example, was not. Bob didn't participate in the translation. That's just the music in those Italian. Or sentences. even dialects. I mean, I'm trying to. I was trying the other day. Imagine any of these pieces being sung by British performers, and with the British accent. <laughs> it's, it's quite hard, isn't it? Uh, well, it's hard to <laughs> imagine the details that way, but I, c I can imagine, I think, I don't know. I mean, you, you hear British singers in classical music singing a kind of standard English, which American singers also use when they sing classical music. I think uh, I'd be interested to hear it. Yeah, I would as well. But I mean, Well, you can put it on. <laughs> but, well, maybe we should, but, but part of the kind of the attraction of the voice, and, and Robert Ashley, for me, is one of the voices well, he's of, you know, yeah. of all time. It's kind of, it, so it's really bound to a person, but that is extended through yourself and the group. Um, but it, it just feels like there's, there's something so wrapped up in the voice and the, the drawl and the kind of the lilt yeah. and the sort of... What, what astonished me when I read Carl Gann's book about Bob Ashley was quite how it, Im immaculately it's kind of composed oh and, yeah. and, and written Total out and detail. process based and you know, in such detail and such attention to structure. But right. of course it doesn't sound like that. It yeah. sounds like it's kind of very loose. In fact, he has this so reputation of sort of being no nothing. People say, well, he's a talented writer, but he's not really making music. You listen carefully to the accompaniments in the electronic music parts. They're very rich, very structured. In fact, he said once, uh, he, you know, he, he, he came up in the 50s. He was born in 1931. Of course, I'm a structuralist. What else would I be? There you go, yeah. <laughs> he was, that's what he was listening to yeah. and learning and being taught how to do. He does that in this piece that we're going to do tonight. He, in, the, in the one with the... Uh, and he, he, it's, it's wheel, wheels within wheels. But the idiom is a sound quality that you get out of the recording studio. It's like the recording studio is his, his orchestra. Mm -hmm. He calls it the, an electronic orchestra. But I wanted to ask a bit about the musical accompaniment um, that goes with, with the text. Accompaniment's not the right word, but anyway, the well, music. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously Blue Jean Tyranny plays a big part yeah, in a number well, of the pieces. He, was, he played in, in Perfect Lives. Uh, Bob had been working with Blue since the, the once group. Blue Jean Tierney was a prodigy, and he went to Juilliard, and they offered him a full scholarship, 
But they said he had to take, he asked them, can I challenge this basic harmony course because I could teach this course. He was 16. Right. And they said, no, you have to take it. So he left his full scholarship to Juilliard, wow. went out to Michigan and knocked on Bob Ashley's door. He had been presenting while in high school, concerts of the music of John Cage and stuff, back when nobody knew John Cage. Yeah. So he knew about the Ones Group. He said, well, I'm not going to go to Juilliard and waste my time. I'll go out and work with the Ones Group. <laughs> That's some career trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but Blue was very shy, and it was hard to get him to play. You can hear it from just a little thing, but he's virtuoso in almost any style. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, so Bob wrote Perfect Lives for the purpose of inventing the character Buddy, the world's greatest piano player, and having, getting Blue to play. He wrote the opera to get his friend Blue to play. That was one of the motivations wow. for that piece. Uh, and, and not, anyway, that was part of it. He made, he made up that yeah, character. He couldn't yeah. tell the story anyway, but he wanted to have the character of Buddy, the world's greatest piano player, to get Blue to loosen up and really play and give and an opportunity. And how directed is he towards the music? I mean, obviously, it's, it's chord structures and things like that, but how much of it is Blue's well, own? It's, Blue refers to it as essentially Bob's opera and Bob's uh, composition. He, people say to him, well, didn't you make make most of that music. He said, no, that's Bob's music. But Bob's music is very minimal. He gives you very little uh, notation to get you to do what you can do. So clearly Blue is doing what he can do mm -hmm. in those places where it's freer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, but he never never claimed, he said he wouldn't have played that music that way if Bob hadn't told him what to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was t it's a different way. You're not telling them every note to play, yeah. but you're taking advantage of what they can do. Imagine if we could have heard Beethoven improvising. He was famous as an improviser. Filled halls with people who come yeah. hear him improvise. Can you imagine yeah. what that would be yeah. like? Well, I do want to maybe just finish it to sort of slightly leave Bob Ashley on the side and just uh, simply raise the uh, or make people aware that you're also a very active improviser and have been for several decades. Yeah I started when I was in my 20s yeah so my, my first improvising trio was in 1965 Wow! wow. <laughs> when nobody was I mean everybody claims they did the first nobody did the first it was in the air and people all over the world were starting to do free improv. I don't mean improvising like in jazz, which predates it by decades, but that's a different thing. Improvising with no pre-existing themes. People were starting to be interested in doing that in the early 60s. It's just and, and you, uh, I think what is notable about your app and the people that you've worked with is um, that uh, you one of the uh, people who quite early on really um, hooked up with people like Roscoe Mitchell, yeah, Roscoe, Wadana, Leo group. Smith, yep. Um, and people from the AACM yes. and the ACM in Chicago, it's the um, associate. Yeah, I was very lucky. Well, I got to know Roscoe. Musicians. He came out to the West Coast and uh, through my, again, through my friend David Wessel, who had helped him get a place. He brought three of the Art Ensemble members out there. They lived in a little, this is important for young people here, they lived in a little one-room house across the street from where David was living in East Palo Alto, which is the black section of Palo Alto, right across the tracks from Stanford. Across the tracks, mind you, it's, it's a cliche. And we came, I'd been away, I'd gotten married, and I'd come back and I went to have dinner with David, and as I arrived, I knew they were there, they, they were there and I'd met, I hadn't met Roscoe, but I'd been listening to their music all the time, and, and recordings. And uh, I went in for dinner, music was coming out of this house. There was a, the, ba the bass player from the uh, Art Ensemble of Chicago, and Roscoe, and the uh, uh, trumpet player, Lester Bowie. Uh, Joseph Jarman, who played with him, was a member of the group, was uh, busy on a project in Chicago, and they had they met Don Moyer, who was their drummer, later on when they were in Paris. So it was just the three members that could come came, and this music was coming out of the house. We had dinner to the sound of the music coming out of the house. We uh, went to sleep to the sound of music coming out of the house. Woke up in the morning to the sound of the same <laughs> live music coming out of the house, and we went over to say hello. And there they had their in the, in the, there was no bedrooms. There was one big room not very big, but one room, and they each had a setup. Roscoe had brought his whole, per he has a percussion cage. He puts his saxophones in the middle of a big cage of gongs and little instruments. He's constantly ma building this. He's, he's still making yeah. instruments all the time. How old is Roscoe Mitchell now? Roscoe is 79. Yeah. yeah. We're one year apart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so he, uh, th and, and uh, 
both the bass player, the bass player also had a, a, a setup of small instruments as well as the bass. And they each had a bedroll on the floor next to their instrument. And basically they practiced all day and into the night, every day, except when they went out to buy food or to do a gig. That's it. And I was, you know, 20 something and I, I, I walked in there and I said, oh, that's how you have to do it. <laughs> Change my life. Yeah. Yeah. Change my, you can't work with Roscoe Mitchell and not work all the time. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it because you were not, you're not going to cut it. Yeah. it wow. It's not, not going to happen. And we were very, very, very fortunate. I had run into a really fine, uh, well, similar to the Ashley thing. It's just you never know when you might be performing in front of somebody who can really do you some good. So I was ready with Bob's piece when I got to go over and, 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 and perform for him. But with Roscoe, I had a duo that had worked for a year with a Japanese-American uh, multi-instrumentalist wind player. And we had been working on duo pieces made, made up improvisationally for a year without even going out and doing a gig. We just were researching as hard as we could. And Roscoe had heard this guy Gerald play. And at that time, in 65, he was more advanced in circular breathing and uh, multiphonics and different sounds than Roscoe was. They were both pursuing the thing. Mm -hmm. So Roscoe was curating a series of uh, workshops for the creative music studio that Ornette Coleman and Carl Berger set up in uh, uh, Woodstock, New York. The same Woodstock where the Woodstock happened. No relation. <laughs> uh, the same location. Uh, and uh, so the tradition there, Errol, Gerald was brought there for two weeks to teach his techniques, at the end of which you give a solo concert and you can invite a guest. And I happened to be on the East Coast. I worked it out and brought my kids back to visit my mom because I was in California. And so th she took care of the kids. I went over there, and Gerald and I gave a performance. I, we did one of our pieces at the end of his performance. And here, Roscoe Mitchell, whom I had idolized, came up to the two of us and said, let's be a trio. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said, I, I, of course, I said, well, I'll think about it. <laughs> and I think I, I just want to finish by saying that it, in recent I don't know, even just the recent five years um, through the scholarship of people, well, people like George Lewis from the ACM, yeah. but also uh, younger scholars such as Benjamin Picot and others have really opened up kind of how perhaps the canon has often been thought of in terms of experimental music yeah. and how we, uh, and the kind of the diversity within mm. that term. Um, yeah. and, and that's been really, really important for scholarship. Um, yeah. But, yes, but you, uh, you know, you've been absolutely at the heart of that kind of diversity well, and I was and lucky, widening that. lucky to be able to do this. The, the great thing historically, you should read George's book, first of all, yeah. a, for, a Force Greater Than Itself. But the amazing thing is this man who just passed away last year, Muhal Richard Abrams, yeah. who was older than the rest of them, and he started an experimental band. Imagine you're here. Says, we have a band, but we only perform pieces written by members of the band. And anybody can come. And if you don't know how to compose, I'll teach you for free. That's how they began. Yeah, yeah. And then they formed a self-help group, which turned out to be for black musicians. It's very interesting. Muhal gave them the freedom to decide what they would do. And the person he was working with closest at the time was a guy who happened to be white, who was a vibes player and percussionist. And uh, the AACM said, no, you know, we want to have it be a black organization. So he let him do it. He didn't say, no, it's my group. You're going to do it my way. You know, so they became a black organization. Yeah. But think about it. Anthony Braxton, yeah. Leroy Jenkins. Joseph Jarman, uh, I mean, I, it's insane. Henry Threadgill, yeah. who won the Pulitzer Prize in music. Yeah. All these people, yeah. if they got to go to school, they got you know to find a small school in Chicago and study with individual people, but they mainly self-taught mm. or teaching each other. Yeah. Muhal, when he was in high school, was carrying around the, the Schillinger analysis book and practicing all the time he had, and he said to his parents, I'm not going back to high school. It's interfering with my music studies. And this family who'd moved up from the South to try to get a better life for their kid said, go ahead. Yeah. And supported him in doing wow. it. And he had a full-time music student for the rest of his life, made, made electronic music, really good electronic music. There's a recording of an orchestra piece of one by him and one by Roscoe on a little label that I've been running called Mutable Music. And uh, it was done with the Orchestra in Ostrava, part of the Ostrava Days New Music Festival, which you should know about. 
It happens every other year. It's in the month of August in Ostrava in the Czech Republic. And Christian Wolf has taught there every year that it's, that it's happened. Alvin Lussier has taught there a lot of, and, and European teachers as well, and younger teachers, but just the ones I happen to remember. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it, we recorded with the Janáček Philharmonic these pieces by these two guys, and Muhal's piece begins with an electronic music introduction. He, he mastered electronic music, but as a black American, he never had an opportunity to play it anywhere. So yeah. he just put, when he got a chance to do the orchestra piece, he put it in there. Yeah. You know, it's pretty yeah. good. And the one thing we didn't get to show, and I can't show tonight because I'm singing with non-singing accompanists and with piano, but uh, some of the pieces uh, use the voices in various different, clear different ways. The piece, uh, Celestial Excursions, there are two stories being told simultaneously, and the engineer does such a good job that if you pay attention and listen to it, you can follow both of them. Uh, and he uses the, the voices as if they were instruments. Yeah. In Dust, which is one of my favorite, they repeat a, 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 a word theme behind another story. But in, in Celestial Excursions, literally two different stories are happening. One is the main story by the soloist, and the others are another story which is, which, which is hiding in the background. And, and, and making, and so all the rhythms are made by the other voices. And that's two awesome perfect lives. There are moments where you just can't hear what's being said because whatever, Blue Jean Tyranny is just going wild or something, and you know, the, the voice is lost. And that, that's there in the recording as well. There's that element of maybe elusiveness. He's got it all tightly scripted, but you can't hear it all. You can't or hear his it voice all. changes it so that you're not quite sure what he's saying. Yeah, he, he was... That was a strange problem. Some people really liked it better when he started using people wh whom they could understand. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, but at the same time, he wants people to think. We, when, when we performed in uh, Japan, we had a piece of extra good fortune to be able to do a seven-city tour of Japan under this uh, special thing which is no longer around, of course. Uh, um, most people would use, share a program with a Japanese composer who would do his thing or her thing. But Bob said, no, I want to work with a Japanese video artist. So this guy, Yuko, Yuki, was a brilliant man. And he made a whole video to go with the story Dust based on him coming over to the United States. And he took, he took excerpts from daytime television and, and made an accompaniment to this thing. He made his own piece yeah. using daytime television. And we had the words translated on the screens right. as well since we okay. had screens. So, but we went to one place and they didn't have the, the technology together and we had to perform this piece without any language subtitle. Imagine the piece is all words. He said, well, you guys have, a, you have the, the, the advantage of being able to do what I really like to hear, which is to hear the music in the words without worrying about the meaning. Mm -hmm. Just hear the music in the words. But it's still very fr frustrating. We, we did it in, a, I'm going to have super titles tonight so you'll understand everything, even though I think most people will understand me uh, when it gets busy. Uh, it's nice to have them there because it's so text heavy. The text just goes flying by. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll have things will be understood. But uh, what he repeats enough purposely so that if you miss something, you'll hear it sort of again. And when, by the time you're done, you'll know what the piece was about. Yeah. And some parts you'll really get clearly and other parts uh, Maybe you'll hear that the next time you listen to it. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's not confusing. You're not sitting there wondering what the hell is going on here. I wish I were somewhere else. <laughs> but but yeah. in Aust Austria, the presenters just screwed up. We were in Vienna. And they simply did not give the audience anything, either a written translation or something. People were throwing stuff at the stage. My friends that went were throwing. Throw, they, they throw pennies <laughs> in Vienna because they were so angry at being left out of the whole piece. Okay. Yeah. yeah, interesting. So uh, uh, we never, you know, this, and this was not Bob's fault. This, yeah. They just didn't do what he asked. Yeah. And we went ahead and performed anyway, and it was, whoo! I always like to end with the thing that got me going. There was, in the, in the 60s, there was a hippie, news, news, a hippie rock channel that had a news program that was unlike most news programs and that actually sort of, occasionally you actually got real news from it. And, uh, 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 they would end their program, it was called The Last News Show, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. <laughs> 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 That's what I like to tell the students at the end of my little talk. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? It's, it's
It's only your fault if you don't get the music you want to hear. 